The next item of business is a debate on motion 8341 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on unconventional oil and gas. May I ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 3rd of October, I set out the conclusion of the Scottish Government's extensive investigation into unconventional oil and gas. I made clear that following our assessment of the evidence, the Scottish Government does not support the development of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland, and an effective ban using our devolved planning powers is now in play place, pending the outcome of the required strategic environmental assessment. Today, I reaffirm that position and honouring the commitment I made on the 8th of November last year, I give Parliament an opportunity to endorse our carefully considered and robust position on unconventional oil and gas. Presiding officer, the government has undertaken one of the most far-reaching investigations of any government anywhere uh, into unconventional oil and gas. This began in 2013 when my predecessor, Fergus Ewing, established an independent expert scientific panel to examine the evidence on unconventional oil and gas, including hydraulic fracturing or fracking and coal bed methane extraction. The panel reported its findings in July 2014. After carefully considering its findings, we introduced a moratorium on onshore unconventional oil and gas in January of 2015. This created space to explore the specific issues and evidential gaps identified by the expert panel and to undertake a comprehensive period of public engagement and dialogue. In early 2016, we commissioned a further suite of independent research reports to address the evidential gaps identified by the panel. The reports covering health, economic and environmental matters allowed us to consider further independent expert scientific advice, including from British Geological Survey, Health Protection Scotland, KPMG and the UK Committee on Climate Change. The research reports were published in full on the 8th of November last year, allowing stakeholders and the people of Scotland almost three months to consider the evidence in advance of our public consultation. That consultation, Talking Fracking, was launched on 31st of January this year. The consultation took a number of innovative steps to encourage debate, dialogue and wide par uh, participation. The consultation findings were published in full on the 3rd of October this year in advance of my uh, ministerial statement. Members across this chamber should be in no doubt. Ours has been a considered programme of investigation that explored the issues in depth and encouraged an informed, balanced dialogue across Scotland. In coming to a view on unconventional oil and gas, we carefully considered the findings of our extensive research alongside the results of our public consultation. In reviewing the research findings, I had particular concerns over the insufficiency of epidemiological evidence on health impacts highlighted by Health Protection Scotland. Health Protection Scotland also noted that a precautionary approach to unconventional oil and gas is warranted on the basis of the available evidence. The position we have taken on unconventional oil and gas is a clear deployment of the precautionary principle. The Committee on Climate Change report set out that the additional emissions generated by unconventional oil and gas extraction in Scotland would make meeting our existing climate change targets more challenging. The committee forecast that greenhouse gas emissions from an industry in 2035 could range from 0.4 megatons of CO2 equivalent to 2.6 megatons of CO2 equivalent under central and high production scenarios, depending on the scale of the industry and the extent of regulation. I'll make some progress and bring Mr Finlay in later for me. I remind the Chamber that Scotland's statutory annual climate change target for 2032 is 26.4 megatons of CO2 equivalent. Indeed, as the committee states in its report, in order to be compatible with Scotland's climate change targets, new emissions from unconventional oil and gas production would need to be offset through reductions in emissions elsewhere in the Scottish economy with consequential costs for the sectors affected. Uh, I'll bring in Mr Finlay. If you, if any, Neil Finlay. Thank, thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Uh, given that, in his words, uh, there is now an effective ban and that there is now no longer any issue of commercial sensitivity, Will he now release all correspondence between the Scottish Government and INEOS regarding the discussions around fracking? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, uh, what to say, Presiding Officer? Um, we, uh, it's a little, little worth uh, taking that, that point, but um, uh, Mr Finlay can continue to press for information if he wishes. I want to get on with the statement we have here. Yeah. Presiding Officer, our consultation embodied our commitment to local communities participating in decisions that matter to them. The overwhelming majority of respondents were opposed to the development of an unconventional oil and gas industry in Scotland. While not a referendum, approximately 99% of the responses were opposed to un unconventional oil and gas extraction in Scotland, and fewer than 1% were in favour. It is our responsibility as a government to make a decision we believe is a, in the best interest of the people of this country. We must be confident that the choices we make will not compromise health and safety or damage the environment in which we live. 
Having considered this matter in detail, it is my view and that of the Scottish Government that there is no social licence for unconventional oil and gas to be taken forward at this time, noting strong opposition in the 13 local authority areas most likely to be impacted by fracking. And the research we commissioned did not provide a strong enough basis from which to address those communities' concerns. Presiding officer, I have noted calls that have been made by some groups. Um, I will take an intervention just now. Murdo Fraser. I am grateful to the Minister for giving way. Would you not accept that the consequence of his ban will be that Scotland will simply import frac gas from other countries? And can he tell us today, are there any other countries whose imports he would rule out taking frac gas from? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, as Mr Fraser knows, uh, I am the Minister for Energy in this country, in Scotland. I do not have any role in terms of in fact, impacting on energy policy in other countries. Uh, it's a commercial matter for any of us to be... It's a commercial matter for any of us. We have been clear throughout this process that that is a commercial matter for any of us. Uh, Presiding officer, our consultation embodied our commitment to lo local communities participating in decisions that matter to them. The overwhelming majority of respondents were opposed to the development of an unconventional oil and gas industry in Scotland. And while not a referendum, as I say, 99% uh, of responses were opposed. Uh, I've noted calls that have been made, made by some groups for new legislation to ban fracking. And the view appears predicated on the opinion that the position we have adopted on unconventional oil and gas is not robust enough. I am confident, however, that the approach we have adopted is sufficiently robust to allow control of unconventional oil and gas development in line with our stated position. So, presiding officer, the, the pursuit of unnecessary legislation would tie up this Parliament's time in the face of other significant issues such as Brexit. Mm -hmm. And in coming to our position, I sought legal advice and considered precedents, including our position on not supporting either new nuclear power stations or underground coal gasification. The approach we have adopted using our fully devolved planning powers is to set out a robust and effective ban using planning policy. Our approach ensures decisions on unsure, uh, unconventional oil and gas developments will be made in line with planning policy and procedure and within the framework of Scottish Government policy, policy that does not support unconventional oil and gas extraction in Scotland. On the 3rd of October, I really must make some progress, but I'll try and bring Mr Whiteman in later. I wrote to Greg Clark, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, setting out a position on the future of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland and seeking his assurance that licensing powers will be transferred to this Parliament as soon as possible and that no such power grab by the UK Government will take place. When those powers are finally fully devolved, we will discharge them in line with our position on unconventional oil and gas. After this debate, we will issue a written policy statement on our position on unconventional oil and gas. This will support preparation of a strategic environmental assessment, which I propose will commence shortly and conclude in summer 2018. We will then formally set out our finalised position, which will be reflected in future iterations of Scotland's energy strategy. Presiding officer, our decision has been welcomed by many across Scotland, particularly in those areas that would be most affected. Of course, an issue that has stimulated such intense debate, there are some who do not support the position we have reached. But listening to the views put across by some, including those on the Conservative benches, you would think we were talking about developments taking place miles away from any population. That is simply not the case, as fracking was proposed across areas of the densely populated central belt of Scotland. Creating employment and inclusive economic growth will always be key priorities for this government. But such objectives cannot come at any cost. We will, of course, continue to work with industries to help improve Scotland's competitiveness and economic growth. Residing officer, we closely considered, considered all the evidence, including the potential economic impact from an unconventional oil and gas industry. Under a central production scenario, researchers at KPMG concluded that on average, an unconventional oil and gas industry would add just 0.1% annually to Scottish GDP if fracking was given the go-ahead and generate up to 1,400 direct, indirect and induced jobs in Scotland at peak production. To put that in context, in 2015, 58,500 jobs were supported by the low carbon and renewable energy sector in Scotland, generating turnover of £10.5 billion. The offshore oil and gas sector employs more than 100,000 people. KPMG also concluded that the volume of natural gas likely to be commercially recoverable from unconventional oil and gas reserves in Scotland would not have an impact on global gas prices. Consequently, there would be no noticeable effect on energy costs for households. This is a view that has also been expressed by Lord Brown, the former chairman of oil and gas operator Quadrilla Resources. Presiding officer, the real risk to Scotland's economy comes from a hard Brexit. Mm -hmm. Fraser of Allender estimated hard Brexit threatens... Oh, I note the member laughs. Mr Fraser laughs. But he might want to pay attention to this. He might want to pay attention to this. Fraser of Allender estimated a hard Brexit threatens to cost our economy around £11 billion a year by 2030 and result in 80,000 fewer jobs. 
80,000 fewer jobs when compared to remaining members of the EU single market and customs union. Mr Fraser really should pay attention to that. I fully understand, I fully understand our decision has disappointed the companies that receive licences from the UK Government, including Ineos, the operators of the Grangemouth Petrochemical Facility. On unconventional oil and gas extraction, we have formed a different view to theirs, but on their desire to see a long-term sustainable future for both the chemicals and refinery businesses at Grangemouth, we are agreed. We recognise the contribution to this country made by Ineos and the chemicals and refinery businesses are strategically significant assets for Scotland. We'll continue working with Ineos to understand their wider business needs and to improve their competitiveness. Uh, before closing, I'd, I'd try and bring in Mr Whiteman, if I may. Andy Whiteman. Very grateful to the Minister. As he knows, I think, I don't doubt the sincerity with which he uh, speaks today and his intention to, to, to ban fracking. But does he accept that the mechanism that he's chosen is a mechanism which is an executive action um, that can be undone by any future government, even if there were a minority in this place, and even if the Parliament as a whole was against fracking. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, I, I recognise the point that Mr Whiteman is making, but I would say to him this. We have it in the, in the scope of this Parliament to express a strong view here today in support of the government's position, make it clear that that is a view that is supported by the people of Scotland in the consultation we've undertaken, and as far as I can read, if I can read the runes, there's only one party in this chamber that even contemplates allowing fracking to proceed at this moment in time, and we can all work to prevent them becoming the government of Scotland. Presiding officer, those whose, those whose livelihoods depend on employment at Grangemouth are important to us, and we will never lose sight of that in our efforts to support innovation and investment. Presiding officer, we've considered the scientific and economic evidence, and I've engaged in the debate and also listened to the views of people across Scotland, something the Conservatives don't appear to want to do. And the motion we have tabled today, which I ask Parliament to support, is a clear and robust response to the evidence and the views expressed through our consultation. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has concluded it's in the public interest to say no to fracking. The steps we have taken have given immediate effect to this position. It's now time for all members of this chamber to set out their view, and I move the motion in my name. I now call Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 8341.3. Thank you. you sorry, uh, Mr. Fraser, my fault. Uh, you have up to seven minutes. Seven minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In relation to the SNP's ludicrous ban on fracking in Scotland, it is difficult to know which aspect of this is worst. Is it this government's abandonment of evidence led policymaking? Is it its contempt for science? Or is it the sheer hypocrisy from a party that in the past has been happy to champion Scotland's hydrocarbon industry, but now simply wants us to rely upon imports of frack gas from elsewhere in the world, wherever that may be? So let's start with the science, Deputy Presiding Officer. For we know exactly what the science on fracking tells us. And the reason we know that is the Scottish Government commissioned its own expert scientific panel to give an independent report, which was published in July 2014. And that report was quite clear. Fracking could be conducted safely in Scotland, providing appropriate safeguards were put in place. That is a view widely shared by scientists and those in industry. The leading geological expert, Professor Rebecca Lunn of Strathclyde University, has slammed the SNP's position as, a, and I quote, uninformed, ethically appalling, and passing the buck. Professor Paul Younger, Rankin Chair of Engineering at Glasgow University, someone held up by the SNP in the past, as an energy engineering expert and a member of that expert scientific panel has slammed the government's position, saying their justifications for a moratorium were, I quote, all made up and completely feigned. He said he felt completely violated as a professional following the announcement as of the, a moratorium. Even the former leader of Greenpeace, Stephen Tyndale, has said the green movement needs to have an urgent rethink over energy sources, and it is time for green campaigners to stop saying frack off and start saying frack on. So here we have a Scottish Government that commissions its own report from expert scientists that it then ignores and treats with contempt. We have a body of scientific opinion in a second. We have a body of scientific opinion very clear that fracking should proceed and can be done safely, and that is also ignored. What we have is an SNP government dancing to the tune of the Green Party rather than listening to the experts and listening to the science. I'll give way to Claudia Beamish. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Could, could the member possibly indicate what uh, the Scottish Tory party 
position is on the climate change chance, which is irrefutable and which he has failed so far to mention. Martin Fraser. Well, the, the, the position on climate change is perfectly simple. If all we're doing is importing frack gas from other jurisdictions, we're going to have any impact on reducing climate change emissions in this country. I thought that is very clear. And that is where, and that is, leads me on very neatly to this point about hypocrisy. Because while fracking in Scotland is to be banned by the SNP, we will continue to see frack gas from elsewhere imported to Scotland to heat our homes and power our industry. Today, 47% in a second, 47% of UK gas demand is coming from imports. Centrica have estimated that by 2020, the UK will be importing 70% of the gas we need, and much of that will be fracked gas coming from elsewhere. I'll give way to the Minister. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you to Murdo Fraser for taking my intervention. If, if we leave aside the fact that Scotland produces 63% of the UK's gas for 8.5% of the population, would he, un, would he uh, confirm his, my understanding is that imports and trade policy are reserved to the UK government. We could not stop imports of gas even if we wanted to, but it is a commercial matter for anyone else. And he's simply misrepresenting the truth uh, to the public today. Yeah. Murdo Fraser. The Minister cannot get away from his hypocrisy on the stance to say fracking is fine in every other country in the world. Fracking is fine. When I intervened on the Minister, I asked him to rule out fracking in any other country in the world. He wouldn't do it. We'll frack from any jurisdiction in the world, regardless of the environmental safeguards. We'll have their frack gas, but we won't do it here safely. And that is why INEOS are importing today 40,000 barrels of shale gas every single day into INEOS. A very welcome development, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it simply means that that imported frack gas from Pennsylvania will have a higher carbon footprint than it would be if we were producing it here. And if we had produced it here, we could set the environmental safeguards, not have them imported from anywhere in the world, regardless of the safeguards that are put in place. Presiding Officer, I don't often quote trade unionists in this chamber, but I do I uh, want to quote specifically uh, Gary Smith, the GMB Scottish Secretary, who denounced the Scottish Government's decision as dishonest and hypocritical, adding that Scotland is importing a huge amount of shale gas from Trump's America. If the Government wants to be consistent, it will now ban shale gas imports, threatening a huge number of job losses. The Government has failed to explain where the two million households in Scotland using gas to heat their homes will get gas from in the future. Presiding officer, those on the Labour benches, Mr Leonard among them, I notice he's not in the chamber this afternoon, he needs to be listening and they need to be listening to what their trade union colleagues are telling them. Now we've heard a lot from the Scottish Government about their consultation. 99% of the responses were opposed. And yet, 40, and yet 86% of those responses were uh, campaign responses or from petitions whipped up by environmental groups. And this led the Minister to tell us in his statement that there was, and I quote, no social licence to allow fracking to proceed, given the level of public opposition within the communities likely to be affected. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a breathtaking statement from a government whose ministers have over the last decade ridden roughshod over local opinion in areas such as Perthshire, in Dumfries and Galloway, and the borders, where there's been local opposition to industrial scale wind turbine developments where local authorities have rejected planning applications and ministers have imposed them in the teeth of substantial local opposition. This is an SNP government deputy presiding officer which has two different standards, one for the central belt of Scotland and another for those living in rural Scotland. And I invite the minister to come with me and meet the people in Dunkeld, feeling under siege from large-scale wind turbine developments in the area, and will tell them exactly what they think about his views on social licence for energy development. If that's now to form part of the Scottish Government's policy, he needs to apply that across the board to onshore wind as well as to fracking. Presiding officer, we know that the SNP's stance on fracking is anti-science. We know they have rejected evidence-based policy making, and we know that it is an entirely hypocritical stance, as all it means is that we will be importing frack gas from other parts of the world rather than doing it here, and we'll be missing out on the economic benefits and jobs that could be provided. But, presiding officer, if the SNP don't want to listen to science, if they don't want to listen to the experts, if they don't want to listen to us, then I can suggest they listen to those in their own party. And they can start with their former deputy leader, Jim Sillers, who has said, oh, they're laughing. They're laughing now. Mr. Deputy Fraser, you officer. must come to I a close. I will remember when they all thought Jim Sillers was the bee's knees when he was your deputy leader. He's told them that their party needs to think again 
with unconventional oil and gas extraction. If they won't listen to you us, must Deputy close, please, officer, Mr. Fraser. they won't listen to anyone else. Listen to Jim Sillers. A fracking bad is bad for Scotland, bad for jobs, bad for the environment. And I move the amendment in my name. I now call Claudia Beamish to speak to and move Amendment 8341.1. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For many across this chamber and this country, this has been a long and hard-fought battle. Unconventional oil and gas extraction, commonly referred to as fracking, is an unwanted technology, misted in uncertainties and incompatible with Scotland's future as a green and progressive nation. There has been a solid mandate to deny fracking in its place in Scotland for over a year since Scottish Labour's amendment against fracking was supported by the Lib Dems and Green MSPs, making a parliamentary majority. This was a significant moment in Labour's non-stop pressure on the SNP to ban fracking in Scotland. And since then, any public consultation on this issue has echoed that sentiment. No ifs, no buts, no fracking in Scotland. My bill proposal received 87% support from public respondents, a figure that cannot be overlooked, and the Scottish Government's talking fracking consultation returned an astonishing majority of 99% uh, of respondents opposed to fracking. I would like to give credit to the activists, NGOs, unions and others who responded to these consultations. Their tireless efforts and shouts were heard loud and clear. The Green Party has already uh, pushed forward on this issue as well. The fact that the UK Tory government continues to disregard these voices is, in my view, utterly shocking. Scottish Labour joined this fight for the sake of our climate, communities, jobs, health and our environment. John Ashton, a respected climate change advisor to many, said, you can be in favour of fixing the climate or you can be in favour of exploit exploiting shale gas, but you can't be in favour of both at the same time. This is a question of climate justice. The Par Paris Agreement included the effort to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, vital to the continued existence of low-lying coastal and island communities. The climate science is indeed irrefutable, which is why this Tory amendment is so out of touch. Christina Figueres, who was recently awarded the Shackleton Medal for her role in the Paris Agreement, said, we will move to a low-carbon world because nature forces us or because policy will guide us. If we wait until nature forces us, the cost will be astronomical. The uncertainty caused by the SNP government's long drawn out process, although I can understand reasons for it, uh, left everyone in the dark. As this parliament scrutinizes the climate change bill, the climate change plan, and the energy strategy, it is absolutely welcome to know that fracking is firmly out of the question. The long-term damage far outweighs any short-term value that might be gained, a value which has been significantly overinflated by the industry. As the Minister has put it, the lack of social licence for fracking is an important point. Communities have rightly campaigned against acting as guinea pigs for the potential health risks, the air and water and ground pollution risks, the, the potential drop in house prices, increased traffic, the disruption to local uh, environments and biodiversity. Historically, these communities have no reason to trust the fossil fuel extraction industry. They are still tackling the scarred landscape and other employment and environmental issues left by the open cast industries. Labour has been an unrelenting voice against fracking for well over a year, speaking in defence of our environment and communities. And it has been the pressure of my bill, which has in many ways helped deliver action to, from the Scottish Government. My concern was that the Scottish Government's position wasn't robust enough, given it could be reversed by a future minister or government with ease. Labour's amendment today offers a layer of protection and a level of parliamentary scrutiny which I'm comfortable with. Not only would there be public consultation for the next review of the national planning framework, but it would be subject to a parliamentary vote. And this is fundamental as it will prevent ministerial direction for an indefinite moratorium from being changed on a ministerial whim. If the Labour amendment is supported, this added layer of protection will mean I will not be progressing my bill to ban fracking. We will also support the Green Amendment, which adds clarity to the licensing arrangements. The second part of our amendment focuses on the positive alternatives to fracking. It is vital that renewable energy is more robustly supported and that there is more support for inclusive patterns of ownership in this sector. Scottish Labour stressed in our 2016 manifesto, we believe in the civic energy future a future that grows local schemes to produce green energy and heat for local use. 
In my own region, I am supporting the hilltop communities of Warnlock Head and Lead Hills in their quest for a sustainable future. The Warnlock Head Trust stresses that they want a future not dependent on community benefit handouts from large corporations and estates. There are also many municipal models of ownership. Nottingham's Robin Hood Energy enables a city-wide vision to be brought to life. Public ownership of renewables is supported by Scottish Labour, as it is by the Scottish Government, and it would be helpful if the Minister could give any more detail of this in his closing remarks. These models, coupled with an inclusive Scottish investment bank, will drive a renewable energy future which belongs to everyone. The Lib Dems amendment is positive in this respect and we will also be supporting it. To give certainty to our communities and support to our renewables energy uh, industry, Scottish Labour will hopefully join with the SNP, Greens and Lib Dems to ensure a resounding parliamentary vote against fracking, which will then never happen in Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. I call Mark Ruskell to speak to and move Amendment 8341.4. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Ruskell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it gives me great pleasure to stand in Parliament today in support of the Scottish Government's motion and also moving an amendment that will make the ban on fracking legally watertight. Greens have opposed fracking from the start, and we welcome the consensus that has grown between progressive parties in this chamber over the years. And today is an historic moment, a turning point in our story. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've fueled our progress on fossils laid down millions of years ago, before humans even existed. But today we mark the beginning of the end of that fossil fuel age and welcome the next chapter in our story, where humankind thrives within the ecological limits of our planet. And to shield ourselves from runaway climate change today, we must leave four-fifths of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. But fracking, of course, goes beyond even the known reserves, exploiting fossil fuels that are not even on the carbon balance sheet yet. So to frack would not only put the brake on climate progress, but to stick us in reverse. Fracking is the toxic fag end of the fossil fuel age. And while the main course of coal was devoured decades ago, the frackers want to return to blighted communities and lick the plate over and over again. And unlike the US, We've already shut down our coal electricity generation, so investing in frac gas has the potential to displace not coal, but renewables. And we certainly don't need to be importing energy policies from Donald Trump, blown in on the hot air of Murdo Fraser and Jim Sillers. The UK Climate Change Committee judged that the widespread, widespread fracking would be incompatible with our climate targets. And it's for that reason, presiding officer, that we underline in our amendment the need for the blank section on fracking in the energy strategy to be filled with a fracking ban. These forms of extreme energy are a distraction from the vision and investment needed to transform our energy system to one which is infinitely renewable, decentralized, democratized, and smart. And our biggest economic opportunities in energy are in building on the offshore oil and gas expertise of the past to commercialize the offshore renewable technologies of today and tomorrow. The risks that the fracking technologies pose to the climate and to communities far outweigh the economic benefits that they could ever deliver. It's just not worth it. Professor John Underhill, Harriet Watt University's chief scientist, described the economic opportunity of fracking as overhyped due to the physical reality of the complexities of our geology. And the communities on the front line in areas already licensed for unconventional gas know what the impacts would be. In 2012, between Stirling and Falkirk, a coal bed methane planning application was submitted for just a couple of dozen wells, and alongside this, processing infrastructure to exploit vast licensed areas. But in public meetings, the developer came clean on the potential for over 600 wells locally, sterilizing areas needed for new housing, bringing noise, air and water pollution risks and landscape impacts. It was quite clear back then that the planning system was failing, with strategic unconventional gas developments being assessed against old planning policies for gravel pits. So it was right that the Scottish Government brought in a temporary moratorium on decisions through a letter to planning authorities. But what has now turned into an indefinite moratorium would only require the stroke of a future minister's pen to undo. So it's time to put in place a watertight ban 
with a firm basis in planning law. And putting the ban into the national planning framework would ensure that if there is a change of government, then the democratic will of Parliament will remain as an effective backstop. It would put the ban on the same footing as the ban on new, new nuclear power stations, providing direction on a national strategic issue, extending the ban beyond the lifetime of this Parliament, while giving guidance to local authorities for the next 15 to 20 years. And for that reason, I welcome that the Scottish Government has accepted our argument to embed the fracking ban into the national planning framework when it comes up for review next year. On licensing, Parliament needs to have powers over onshore oil and gas licensing devolved, as agreed under the 2016 Scotland Act. And leaving arguments over Brexit and return of powers and wider European oil and gas frameworks aside, the agreed powers promised to this Parliament are overdue. That commencement order needs signed immediately by UK ministers, and we must unite as a Parliament to demand it. And we expect and demand that these powers, when they arrive, be used in a way which is consistent with both the energy strategy and the national planning framework. There simply is no place in policy or on the ground for fracking in Scotland. Finally, presiding officer, I'd like to pay tribute to all those who've written letters and scientific papers, ran street stalls and public meetings, petitioned neighbours and grown networks of concerned communities across Scotland, Britain and the wider world. These activists and communities have demanded the truth and they've got it. And I'd also like to pay tribute to politicians who've listened and acted, from councillors to MSPs such as Alison Johnson, Claudia Beamish and the minister himself. You've all shown leadership within your parties, your movements and across the country. This is our moment to ban fracking and I move the amendment in my name. I call Liam MacArthur to speak to and move Amendment 8341.2. Up to six minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, uh, Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome both this debate and indeed the thrust uh, of the approach taken by the government in relation to unconventional oil and gas extraction. As I said, following the Minister's statement uh, a fortnight or so ago, I believe the approach represents the best way of implementing an effective and immediate ban on fracking in Scotland. That said, I hope Parliament will also support the amendments uh, in, lodged by myself, uh, Claudia Beamish and Mark Ruskell. All, I believe, will help provide further confidence about the longer-term robustness of the ban, while also setting it in the wider context of the energy strategy we need if we are to meet our climate and other objectives going forward. Uh, can I also take the opportunity uh, to pay tribute to Claudia Beamish uh, for her efforts uh, on this issue? I think Mark Ruskell is right in drawing uh, attention to the wider uh, 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 sort of consensus that has built up over time. But I'm in no doubt that her members' bill, which I've supported from the outset, played a key role in keeping the Minister's uh, feet to the fire. As for the final amendment, I simply do not accept Tory accusations that a ban on fracking is either anti-science or anti-jobs. Uh, anti it is neither. The scientific evidence throws down significant challenges were we to go down the route of fracking in Scotland. These are challenges we would struggle to overcome. They would also come at a cost, as the Minister said, not least in jobs in other areas. And I appreciate that the SNP Ministers have done themselves no favours in the past in taking decisions that appear to have no scientific underpinning. Indeed, I've been critical of them for doing so. Yet the same simply cannot be said in this instance. The steps taken to weigh up the evidence in relation to environmental, health, health, social and other potential impacts of fracking have been extensive. Indeed, Mr Wheelhouse even stands accused of having taken the scenic route in reaching his decision. Nevertheless, the decision has been arrived at following a process that few can argue has not demonstrably engaged expert stakeholders and the wider public. 99% of responses to the consultation support some form of ban on fracking in Scotland, an overwhelming figure. I am, however, a little uncertain what the consequences might be of the Minister's repeated references in his statement to fracking having, quote, no social licence. He may need to spell out exactly what is meant by this concept, and as Murdo Fraser um, pointed out, the, the opponents to wind farms and perhaps other energy developments will be rubbing their hands at the prospect of what a social licence uh, might mean. If the Minister is to avoid making a rod for his own back and making delivery of the wider energy strategy more difficult as a consequence, explicit uh, parameters of what a social licence is are needed. 
This should not, though, detract from the case for banning uh, fracking in Scotland. On environmental grounds, we know that shale gas is a high carbon energy source emitting large quantities of carbon dioxide and methane. The science of global warming, the mass of our emissions and our uh, pledge to limit temperature increases to below 2% must lead us to conclude that opening up a new carbon front is unwise, unwanted and unnecessary. The Committee on Climate Change has argued should an onshore petroleum industry be established in the UK and grow quickly, this would have the potential for significant impact on UK emissions. It also found that accommodating additional emissions from shale gas production within our carbon targets would quote, require significant and potentially difficult offsetting effort elsewhere. Even the UK's own former chief scientist, Professor David Mackay, stated, if a country brings any additional fossil fuel reserve into production, then in the absence of strong climate change policies, it is likely that this production would increase cumulative emissions in the long run. This increase would work against global efforts on climate change. In addition, as my amendment makes clear, a commitment to fracking would almost inevitably distract attention and divert investment from the development of the range of renewable energy and storage technologies we will need to deliver a decarbonised, sustainable and secure energy system in future. Along with energy efficiency and demand reduction strategies, these are the areas where we must be looking to focus our efforts, harness our competitive advantage and secure the jobs and wealth cre creation that come with it. ONS has shown that last year low carbon industries in Scotland generated 10.7 billion in turnover, supported 43,500 jobs both directly and in the supply chain and delivered over 10 million pounds of community benefit. While the renewable electricity sector has made tremendous progress in recent years, however, much work still needs to be done to decarbonise our overall energy supply, particularly in heat and transport. Given this, fracking is a distraction we can ill afford. There have, of course, been concerns raised about just how robust the proposed ban on fracking actually is. The current proposals use the planning powers to ensure any applications for unconventional oil and gas exploration are called in by ministers and will be rejected. Like others, Scottish Liberal Democrats want to see future licensing powers devolved to this parliament and used to reinforce the clear policy intention. Meantime, I think there is a strong argument for building the key planks of the energy strategy, including the ban on fracking, into the next national planning framework uh, as proposed in the Labour and Green amendments. While no government or parliament can bind the hands uh, of their successors, any future government intent on moving away from the current ban should face significant obstacles in doing so, including securing the support from this parliament. Inclusion of the policy uh, in the planning framework, I believe, would provide additional reassurance to those who have been expressing concern and also help reinforce the, effective, the effectiveness of this ban. As an aside, while ministers are reviewing the planning framework, they may wish to address the point raised by RSPB in their briefing. Given all that has been said today about meeting our climate change tar targets and environmental impacts, it is passing strange that the government's planning policy still, quote, recognises the national benefit of the indigenous coal production in maintaining a diverse energy mix. Deputy Presiding Officer, I understand the frustration felt by many at the time it has taken to reach this point. For the communities facing the prospect of fracking, the wait has been an anxious one. Hopefully that uncertainty is coming to an end. I look forward to Parliament reiterating its firm stance on fracking at decision time this evening. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We now move to the open debate contributions. The speeches of up to five minutes, please. And I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'm pleased to contribute to this debate today, not least because it's been a contentious issue in my Falkirk East constituency since around 2012, when fracking in Falkirk District first appeared on the radar. Of course, coal bed methane extraction in the area had already started, uh, which had come in under the radar, with planning permissions being granted by council officers under delegated powers before it ever appeared on a Falkirk Council Planning Committee agenda. However, I don't want to dwell on the specifics of the planning system in Falkirk District today. It could take a while, um, as my uh, speaking time is short, and, and for that reason, I'll not be taking any interventions either. So, fracking cannot and will not take place in Scotland. That's the phrase the Energy Minister used in his statement in this chamber just a few weeks ago, and it's something many thousands of my constituents and campaigners across Scotland have been hoping to hear for some time. This announcement came as a great relief to those in communities where the threat of fracking has been on their doorsteps or under their houses for some time. And personally, I'm pleased that these measures have been put in place. I've always been skeptical of these practices and have long been of the view that if there is any risk whatsoever of environmental damage, 
then fracking should not be allowed in Scotland. Understandably, frustration and emotions have run high throughout the debate on unconventional oil and gas. However, the consultation process, the various ministerial, ministerial statements along the way, and today's debate proves that this government has taken the right and necessary steps to bring about the strict and effective ban needed to protect our, our environment. That being said, as we can see from today's amendments, there are still those who are uh, pushing for more to be done. However, there's very little in the Green, Labour and Lib Dem amendments that I can disagree with. Uh, the call by Mark Ruskell and Claudia Beamish to incorporate the government's position in the next iteration of the National Planning Framework is, in my view, imperative. Uh, and I would be keen to hear in the summing up the minister, uh, if the Minister will ensure its inclusion in NPF 4. There are, of course, calls from environmental NGOs to go even further. Um, perhaps uh, they should be careful what they wish for. Um, I believe a bill to, to ban fracking is not necessary, expedient or likely to provide any practical benefits over the approach the Scottish Government has already adopted. Additionally, of course, any legislation is open to legal challenge and can be overturned by future parliaments. Taking the current approach of an indefinite moratorium is effective in halting fracking and UCG whilst avoiding any unnecessary and costly legal challenges. There are also those on the other side of the argument, as we've, we've heard already this afternoon, who claim that this is a step too far and is going against the potential economic gain we could perhaps benefit from. This argument could be a tad academic if expert Professor uh, John Underhill, Harriet Watts' chief scientist and professor of exploration geoscience, is correct in saying that large-scale onshore fracking would be unviable in the UK anyway and would have a negligible impact upon energy prices. He bases that argument on the fact that the substrata of the UK is compressed because of a squeeze millions of years ago between the Alps and the Mid-Atlantic structure at the time. And the compression means the substrata is undulating and wavy, possibly making effective drilling locations questionable. In addition, the UK does not lie flat on the global surface, but at an angle, adding complications to the undulating structure, which uh, Professor Underhill states means the UK's rocks will be harder to drill through than those in the US, which are comparatively simple to do. So I would urge members on the Tory benches to uh, read Professor Underhill's research, disappointing though it may be to them. So it would seem that INEOS and other prospective investors may be 55 million years too late, uh, at least in Scotland. In fact, presiding officer, this chamber debate may well be 55 million years too late. Uh, members will no doubt be aware that the Grangemouth refinery and petrochemical sites are situated within my Falkirk East constituency, and my constituents have more of a direct connection with these industries than most. For decades, these communities have sat cheek by jowl with industry, and I'm pleased that the government has listened to their concerns, as well as taken into consideration the needs of industry and made the right decision based on the evidence presented to them. However, President Officer, I believe it's also incumbent upon government to support our industries and the jobs associated with them and encourage further diversification into more modern, sustainable and renewable technologies. The sites in Grangemouth run by INEOS and Petro INEOS currently employ around 1,350 people, with this figure expected to rise to around 1,650 with the acquisition by INEOS of the 40s pipeline system. Additionally, statistics from Scottish Enterprise and Chemical Sciences Scotland suggests that in Falkirk District, industry in Grangemouth supports over 4,000 jobs directly and indirectly, and many more across Scotland. And I'm confident the Scottish Government will continue to support these industries in the coming years and decades. President Officer, as time is short, uh, I'll close by saying if this effective ban is approved by Parliament this evening, we will have certainty from today. There will be no fracking in Scotland. That's good news for my constituents, good news with regard to climate change, and good news for Scotland. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I refer uh, to my register of interest in relation to a smart energy company based in England. Today's debate is important for a number of reasons, including the significant missed opportunity for the economy that the ban of fracking represents, and the wider concerns that the, the ban of fracking gives rise to in terms of how this government makes policy and whether it is really acting in the best interests of Scotland or in the narrow political interests of the SNP. Let me start with the economic case in support of fracking, which is clear and compelling. 
KPMG's economic impact assessment has shown that up to $4.6 billion in additional gross value-added output could be generated by developing a fracking industry here in Scotland. This could create more than 3,000 highly skilled jobs and bring £4 billion in additional tax receipts to the Scottish economy, which could be spent on vital public services here in Scotland. I, I won't. I'm sorry, I've got very limited time. Communities across Scotland would benefit from these new jobs as well as millions of pounds of new community investment. The Minister highlighted that the economic benefit of fracking would contribute, in his words, just 0.1% to GDP each year. But let me remind him that Scotland's economy registered negative growth in 2016 and the latest figures show economic growth of 0.1%, the same level of growth that would be contributed by fracking. So with this economic backdrop, the boost that could come from fracking, the boost that would give to the Scottish economy should be welcomed by the SNP. Instead, however, as fracking industries are developed elsewhere in the UK and across the world, the SNP has decided to block the investment, the skilled employment, technology development and academic research that this new industry would bring to Scotland. The scientific and environmental analysis to support fracking is also clear. The Scottish Government's own expert scientific panel concluded the technology exists to allow the safe extraction of reserves subject to robust regulation. Public health bodies in other parts of the UK have concluded the potential risks to public health associated with extraction are low if operations are properly run and regulated. Nor can the SNP credibly claim that the fracking ban is based on environmental concerns when Scotland continues to import 40,000 barrels of shale gas from the US every day. As the Royal Society of Edinburgh has quite rightly pointed out, the global carbon footprint of the gas that Scotland imports is far, far higher than onshore fracking in Scotland. If this government really wanted to test the safety of fracking in an evidence-led process, it could have run a series of pilot studies to assess the safety and environmental impact. Instead, however, rather than follow an evidence-led approach, Rather than follow the clear advice of scientists and experts, the SNP has decided to hide behind a deeply flawed consultation process to just its justify its politically expedient and populist decision to ban fracking. And this is why the SNP's ban of fracking gives rise to wider concerns about how, the, how this government makes policy. Policy making to attract headlines, Policies lacking analysis or supporting evidence and policy announce announcements to meet populist demands have become the hallmark of this government. We have seen the ban on GM crops, a policy decision made without any scientific advice, the proposed citizens', citizens income, a policy that the SNP's own economic advisers have warned against but is being pursued for populist reasons, the proposed nationalised energy company announced to attract headlines at the SNP conference, but again, without any analysis of how it will work. Deputy Presiding Officer, the list of SNP policy failures is long, and this ban of fracking is just the latest example of the SNP making policy decisions based on its own narrow political interests. It is now time for this government to start acting in the best interests of Scotland. And Deputy Presiding Officer, it looks like I have finished within the time available. It leaves me just to support the amendment in Murdo Fraser's name. Thank you. Christina McKelvey to be followed uh, by Claire Baker. Really. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, as we've heard, the technology around fracking is complicated, but the message today is very simple. Virtually no one in Scotland wants it especially when it could take place literally in your own backyard. And that's the issue for my constituents. Whilst the Scottish Government has been working and leading the way in developing renewable energy, we have a Tory Government that has been working against renewables at every single turn. And let's look at the people speaking out about this. Every charity or lobbying organisation with an interest in the environment is today breathing out a tremendous sense of relief. Presiding Officer, Murdo Fraser will frack under your house and build a nuclear power station in your back garden. That's Tory environmental policy. But from the South Lanarkshire Against Unconventional Gas to the World Wildlife Fund, to the Friends of the Earth, to Frack Off, to Unison Scotland and the Transition Network, there is a genuine delight about the outcome of the courage of the Scottish Government to take the decision to prevent the developers from destroying our beautiful landscapes and polluting our water table. There isn't, to get rid of the myth, any convincing economic case, in spite of what those say who are promoting fracking. 
In my constituency, the economic impact of Brexit, which for South Lanarkshire Council could be as much as £1.3 billion lost to the local economy, far outweighs any economic benefit from fracking under my constituents' homes. In Hamilton, Lark, Collins, and Stonehouse, there's a strong movement led by the South Lanarkshire against unconventional gas, and I had many, many representations from my constituents. The public certainly responded to the calls for views when the second largest consultation ever run by the Scottish Government took place. A nation built on a social contract with its people, presiding officer, is a nation that is reflective of its people. There was a total of 60,535 valid responses and 99%, yes, 99% were opposed to fracking. The people in South Lanarkshire and across Scotland had deep concerns about the development of fracking, and why, and which is why the Scottish Government put in place the moratorium while we uh, gathered the evidence needed. And whether the Minister took the scenic route or not, I'd rather he took the correct route, and that's the route I believe he has taken. The judgment is now clear. We could not and will not pursue fracking without absolute confidence that it could not undermine public health or climate change targets. More importantly, my constituents have made themselves clear they said no to fracking. And I would like to pay tribute to those constituents, to the South Lanarkshire Against Unconventional Gas Group, who I had great pleasure in meeting on uh, many occasions, but certainly here in this parliament a few months ago, to help them hand over their completed consultations to the minister. It was public action done in a positive way, and they were here to take that opportunity. The active and committed work to highlight dangerous health risks, the dilution of our climate change goals, all in an effort that will only line the pockets of commercial operators who have no need to think about the longer term damage they will cause. We have seen this over and over again. We need to change the record. The payments that some of these companies have promised may never materialise as we've seen before, and they certainly won't cover the cost of the damage, even if it is a test pit. Because if it's a test pit and it pollutes the water table, it's polluted. We can't go back. Presiding officer, the biggest concern for my constituents was to their health, especially the health of their children who are developing. Global reports identify evidence of increased cancers, respiratory and cardiovascular disease, impacts on reproductive health and fetal development, impacts on the nervous system, skin problems, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, headaches, dizziness, eye and throat irritation and nosebleeds. That would give you a nosebleed just reading that, presiding officer, because that's not what my constituents want and I back them 100%. Presiding officer, I applaud the Scottish Government and this Scottish Parliament. If we take this decision today as a unified group, with maybe one exception, then I think that's something we should be incredibly proud of. We are putting our constituents first. We are putting our environment first. We are putting our community first. This is a huge win for us. It's a huge win for the anti-fracking movement, who have been working for at least six years that I know of on this decision. The Scottish Government has taken the correct approach, presiding officer. They have listened to the evidence. They have listened to the experts. They have listened to our colleagues across the chamber. But more importantly, presiding officer, they have listened to the people and the people have spoken. Claire Baker, followed by Colin Beatty. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. I am pleased that the Scottish Government has reached a decision to extend the moratorium on fracking of unconventional oil and gas for a number of reasons. This has been an interesting debate over the last few years and I have been pleased to work alongside campaigners who have argued that we should not exploit this source of energy, citing environmental, health and climate change concerns. I was not convinced by arguments brought forward by those who favour fracking then any more than I am today. Fracking first came to my attention when I led on environment issues for the Labour Party. I came to the issue willing to engage and the campaigns were in their infancy, led at a national level by Friends of the Earth. The briefing from the RSC today presents the different arguments around fracking. There are a lot of uncertainties around the practice. At the early stages, applications were going through the local planning process where decisions were often delegated and there was a recognised confusion and a lack of consistency over decisions being taken. At that point, the industry was at risk of developing with very little scrutiny or accountability. 
It was interesting to look back at the official reports from then, when the then Government Minister was often evasive, non-committal and reluctant to take action. And it has taken a lot of conviction from campaigners to get us to this point. I accept that the Government wished to be thorough, but we have had years of uncertainty for communities and the industry. We have had a long period of indecision, but I am pleased that tonight we have the opportunity to be clear in our direction of travel and provide a focus for what needs to be done to provide for our energy needs in a modern, forward-looking country. Initially, I met with environment organisations, local communities and the industry. I was always clear about the unacceptable risks to, the region, to my region if this practice was to go ahead. It is impossible to compare the experience internationally with those predicted in Scotland. Many argued that the low cost of gas in America due to exploitation of unconventional gas could be replicated here, but that was to ignore the predicted higher cost of extraction in Scotland, where our environmental standards are higher and the export market is different. I also have concerns over population density in the targeted areas, largely former coldfield areas, where concerns are also raised over ground stability and risk to water quality. The economic benefits to local areas are often exaggerated as the initial investment of establishing the infrastructure, there are then few employment opportunities. There is also the prospect of licences being issued and exploratory work beginning, along with the accompanying disruption for communities, for it then to result in very little results, as it is only question marks over the potential source of energy. The evidence concerning the risk to the environment and health were always inconclusive and could not carry the confidence of communities. These factors held great uncertainty for communities, which have over years carried the legacy of coal mining, an industry which, while bringing benefits, left a poor health legacy in too many cases. I was also concerned about the potential for a UCG, which was proposed for the first of fourth, a busy stretch of water, with commercial as well as increasing the environmental protections operating. And I urged the government to include this in the initial moratorium, and I was pleased that they responded positively, and I'm going on to strengthen that. I welcome the minister's statement before recess, but I thought he could have been firmer in some of his reasoning, which would give greater confidence to this decision. He spoke about a lack of a social licence for unconventional oil and gas to be taken forward at this time, reflecting the significant numbers of responses received. There are two things I want to highlight about this. I agree with the comments made with Liam MacArthur earlier over his concerns about the use of social licence. And also I feel the use of at this time raises some concerns and the Minister will be aware of the continuing campaign emails asking for a future legislative solution. The argument that the moratorium can be reversed is well made and I believe that Labour's amendment today can provide greater security and certainty. Also the argument opposing the exploitation of unconventional oil and gas can be strongly made on the basis of scientific evidence and while the public consultation was important and very valuable, the Minister could have been stronger in setting out the environmental challenges we face if we are to meet our long term and inter interim climate targets. But I also recognise the challenges in providing for Scotland's energy needs. Reducing our over-reliance on fossil fuels and investing more into renewables is crucial to our future, both in terms of meeting our energy demands and our climate change targets. But this is not easy as the demand for energy continues both domestically and in our economy. The considerable difficulties for our energy market of Brexit can't be underestimated and energy security and affordability are key issues going forward. I am glad that the exploitation of unconventional oil and gas will not play a part in tackling these challenges in Scotland. But, while these, but, but these are still challenges that must be met. But we can also see opportunities for us to invest in our, in our country's future if we look towards renewables in a much firmer fashion. Thank you. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Beattie, please. Presiding officer, the... The Scottish Government's four-month public consultation resulted in 60,535 responses, the second largest response to a public consultation. 99% of these responses were opposed to fracking and less than 1% in favour. That level of response is overwhelming and a clear indicator of support from the vast majority of people to move forward with a ban on fracking. It is impossible to argue that the public wants anything to do with it in Scotland. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking is a well stimulation technique in which water, sand and chemicals or fracking fluid are pumped underground at high pressure to create fissures and remove the natural gas. While it sounds simple on paper, 
The fracking process runs the risk of tri triggering hazards such as earthquakes and contaminating surface water. Fracking also produces waste that is difficult to dispose of and needs its own disposal site, taking and ruining even more land. And while such large areas are easier to accommodate and are more readily available in the vast regions of the US, for example, Scotland does not have the endless quantities of land to spare. And even if it did, wells fail, ex accidents happen, and nearby towns' water can easily be contaminated with poisonous toxins. I'm sorry, I've got a limited amount of time here. In April 2011, Can I just the say to members, please sit down just now, Mr. Beattie, and say to members, I'm not, please sit down just now. I, I'm not, please sit down just now. Sure. Just, it's not, you've not done anything wrong. It's just to say there's time in hand if members do want to take interventions. That's not directing you in any way, but just to remind members there is time in hand. Sorry, Mr. Beattie, please continue. In April 2011, the people of Northwest England were shaken awake. The local people read in the papers the next day that there was in fact an earthquake. It had occurred the same week hydraulic fracturing began about a mile and a half away. And those who experienced the earthquake responded with shock. There had never been earthquakes in the region as far as anyone knew. And it did not appear to be a natural occurrence. Ultimately, it was connected with fracturing occurring kilometers below the surface. In 2015, a paper was published in Science magazine. Its purpose was to study if it were possible to reduce the hazards of induced seismicity or man-made earthquakes created through hydraulic fracturing. Human-induced earthquakes were plaguing large areas of the United States at that time due to fracking, and scientists were examining that if the variables were changed, whether they could control or stop the man-made earthquakes. The scientists were trying to control the consequences of fracking's actions. And there are a multitude of cases describing the devastating effects that fracking has in communities. And is it not enough to learn from other countries' mistakes? Must Scotland also bring fracking and the potential problems that, occur, that accompanies it simply to learn the same lesson? And my answer simply is no. Rather than subjecting our constituents to the risk of poisonous water and avoidable earthquakes, we need to ban fracking. As my constituents and colleagues well know, I believe fracking has no place, place in Scotland. If coal bed methane extraction were to occur within my constituency, the beautiful landscape would be forever marred, and both Musselburgh and Midlothian North would run the risk of contaminated water and ruined soil. Such effects would be detrimental to our communities, and we simply cannot stand by and let it happen. Meanwhile, the Tories claim that they're in favour of green and environmental initiatives, yet they're in favour of pumping chemicals into the earth. How can one argue they want to protect the environment when they're in favour of fracking? Or are they refusing to recognise the damages that fracking causes? Or do they honestly believe it is a long, good long-term investment? And if they're truly confused, confused and believe fracking is a solid investment, let me spread some light on the matter. There's actually little point to fracking in general. What once possibly seemed to be a promising opportunity has turned into a money pit, even for those in favour. When pro-frackers argue that it would be a waste not to tap into the energy resource beneath our feet, not only are they ignoring the negative ecological effects fracking causes, but that fracking in itself is a terrible investment. Three years after a well begins producing, almost all the resource has been collected. Fracking is not a sustainable resource. If a well does not continually expand, within three years, 95% of the natural gas will have been collected and the well rendered useless. According to the London Evening Standard, independent industry observers reckon that in 2012-13, well before the price collapse of oil, companies in the US were spending around $42 billion a year to maintain production. The value of gas produced was reckoned to be $32 billion. Such a measurement shows that the companies were actually losing $10 billion a year to perform hydraulic fracturing. Contrary to belief, unconventional gas is already very expensive to produce. Companies need high energy prices to even make a profit, and fracking wells drain quickly, continually causing production prices to be high, and therefore the cost of fracking to be high. As of the 20th of October this year, the price of oil at $51.46 a barrel was far below the price that fracking requires to make a profit, which is around $100 a barrel. With fracking, nobody wins, even those in favor of it. And these statistics come with the assumption that there is natural gas to be found in general, but ignores that not all wells perform. In 2015, the US company Chevron 
terminated its operations in Romania, partly due to underwhelming results. According to the news site RT, globally, Chevron's 2014 failure rate stood at 30%. 16 of the 53 wells drilled were found to have no commercially viable quantities of oil or natural gas. If we allow fracking to occur in Scotland, it will continue to spread like a virus. Since the wells drain quickly, it continually needs to feed into other areas. After knowingly pumping toxic fluids into the ground, fracking destroys what it leaves behind. We should and need to ban fracking without exception, and I support the Scottish Government's ban. Thank you very much, Mr Beattie. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Ash Denham. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I should say from the outset, I didn't wake up this morning a born-again fracking champion. Uh, like the government, I too have heard many of the public concerns aired throughout this prolonged but somewhat evidence-led approach to this controversial subject over the past few years. To some, the very word fracking itself conjures up much imagery and often negative opinions uh, from a wide range of, in my view, educated sources were sought and were duly given, and it was right and proper to do so. But I approach today's debate with a view that it is also right and proper to ensure that the government takes decisions based on evidence and facts, not just opinion polls and email petitions. I fear that the government's spin machine has decided that the issue of fracking is no longer the place for scientific opinion. And I'm not alone in this analysis. Dr. Chris Masters, co-chairman of the Scottish Science Advisory Council and the fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, has also expressed concern that this decision has diminished Scotland's reputation as a world leader in science. On the 13th of October, he was quoted in the Times as saying, it seems increasingly that the Scottish government is almost ignoring scientific evidence. We've moved from a situation where we talked about evidence-based policy to a situation where we're looking for policy-based evidence. They determine the policy first and then find the evidence to support it. In fact, just a few weeks ago, uh, I will. Mr. Grateful to Mr. Green for taking intervention. How would he respond to accusations that his own government in, in London proceeded with fracking in England without undertaking the scientific evidence that we have gathered or asking public opinion? They've done neither. Jamie Green. Uh, I think I just said that I supported the government's approach to seeking the views of a wide range of people. The problem is I haven't heard any substantive evidence from the minister on why or how he made his decision. Now, in fact, the minister himself said, and I quote, I'm sure that an unconventional oil and gas industry would work to the highest environmental and health and safety standards. So by this logic, does he now think that unconventional gas extraction would be, be performed safely or not? Or does he not trust that our regulatory environment in our energy markets is robust enough to regulate this industry? It is entirely unclear what specific scientific evidence the minister has used as a basis to make his decision, and I'd be welcome to give way if he's willing to clarify that. Minister. I'm not going through all of it, but I'll, I'll cite one example. In terms of the, he is quite correct that we've, we've stressed that in Scotland, a well-regulated industry could, could take place. However, even in that context, KPMG indicate there would be additional climate emissions with the well-regulated industry that would be extremely difficult to mitigate against our annual statutory climate change targets. That is science and that is practical action. We are not going forward with fracking. Jamie Green. So the, the Minister is using environmental targets uh, as a rationale uh, for explaining his scientific evidence. The, the, the environmental targets are one thing. I'm still yet to hear specific examples in this chamber of why the Minister thinks unconventional gas is safe or not. Still waiting. He uses instead the phrase that there's no social license for unconventional gas and oil. Is social license different from a scientific license? The minister fails to acknowledge completely that in other countries, advances in technology combined with a strong regulatory environment and a trial-based approach have made extraction safe and sustainable. It is indeed very puzzling that the Scottish Government would hold such strong opposition to this practice yet they are happy for 40,000 barrels of shale gas to be imported into Scotland every day, I won't. The SNP seems happy for shale gas to be extracted elsewhere in the world and to be shipped to Scotland to meet our energy needs, but rule out any chance of the creation of an indigenous market. So I ask if the government deems it an unsafe 
or risky form of energy creation? Why are they so happy to benefit from the product of the process, but be so appalled by its method of production? Because therein lies the contradiction of this decision. And Scotland will not just lo uh, lose out the jobs of this ban, but also the inward investment we greatly need. England is set to receive £33 billion pounds in shale gas investment over the next two decades, and it's all subsidy free. A blanket ban risks sending critical expertise in hydrocarbon extraction to England or indeed overseas. And this all sounds very familiar, presiding officer. As someone who represents a community with a nuclear power station on its doorstep, I am fully aware of what happens when a government takes a politically negative view to an energy industry. Now, I do respect the continued and lifelong ideological opposition that some have to its very existence. But over the decades, Hunterston has provided Scotland a high volume of energy, a high number of high quality jobs and high standards in safety. The government's antipathy towards both nuclear and unconventional gas is ideological and nothing more. Now, as I said in my opening lines of the speech, I'm not, I'm not arguing for a gung-ho, full steam ahead approach to unconventional gas extraction, but I do believe that this decision is about more than fracking. It is about undermining the ability of communities to decide for themselves, something which I feel strongly about. And I also think that it has been poorly presented to Parliament. The members in his last 30 seconds. The decision has been poorly presented to Parliament, and as a result, call me a cynic perhaps, but this seems to be nothing more than a political decision. Thank you very much. I call Ash Denham to be followed by Neil Finlay. Ms Denham, please. Thank you. Fracking has been an issue that many of my constituents have been adamantly opposed to for some time. In fact, myself as a candidate, my position against fracking was an issue that I highlighted during my campaign for election. Today, for those in Edinburgh Eastern, I am going to be very proud to vote in favour of the Scottish Government's ban on fracking. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention a campaign group, our fourth fractivists from my constituency who are in the gallery today for their hard work and continued work on this issue. The public consultation on this matter proved that my constituency was not alone. Only 1% of the 60,000 respondents voiced their support for fracking in Scotland, and it is no wonder why. The consequences for the environment and for public health are nothing but dire. This decision shows that the SNP government prioritised the environment and have a vision for a different Scotland, a Scotland that has become a global leader on the environment and the fight against climate change. Scotland has already exceeded its target of producing 50% of electricity from renewables by 2015. And by 2030, the SNP aims for Scotland to have an entirely decarbonised electricity sector. Just earlier this month, on the 2nd of October, Scotland's wind power produced double the amount of electricity needed for the country's total daily energy consumption. And our proposals in this year's programme for government earned praise from the UN's Head of Environment. To allow fracking to go forward, then, would be incompatible with this government's climate leadership, and more importantly, it would be in direct violation of public opinion. There is, as the Minister said, no social licence for it. In direct contrast, around this time last year in England, the Tory UK government intervened in Lancashire Council's fracking ban, overturning the decision and riding roughshod over local residents in favour of a shale company. Now, we've already seen what a Conservative government has done to disabled people, to homeless people, to struggling families and now to local communities. It seems that Tory policy is, as ever, to know the price of everything and the value of nothing. But Scotland should not be led under a narrow-minded, growth-at-any-cost mentality, because that way of thinking, that way of governing, would see some fracking jobs created at the expense of the very air we breathe and the water we drink. It would see an industry propped up in the short term while damaging our environment in the long term. And even when the threat to our planet is clear, even when the voice of the Scottish public is resolute, even when the health hazards are spelled out in black and white, the Tories will still take the side of an industry that would inflict all of this harm on the people and communities that they are meant to represent. 
but the SNP is looking beyond the likes of fracking that would inflict harm on Scotland's environment and its people. Instead, we are opting for investment in renewable forms of energy. This clean power will provide electricity and also heating, and this further investment will create jobs whilst also protecting the environment. Our critics suggest that we are turning our backs on jobs and on profits, but the evidence doesn't support that. The KPMG report concluded that fracking would bring 1,400 direct, indirect and induced jobs to Scotland at its peak and around two to maybe three billion pounds through to 2062. But in contrast to that, Scotland's natural environment is valued at more than 20 billion pounds a year and it supports 60,000 direct jobs alone. So to invest in one industry proven to devastate a much more valuable industry by far is not a renaissance, it is madness. In reality, the only ones in this chamber that have turned their backs on anyone are the Tories. They've turned their backs on the environment, they've turned their backs on local communities, and they've turned their backs on the will of the Scottish people. And if that were not enough, the UK government might be potentially attempting to re-reserve the EU licensing regime, which should rightfully come to the Scottish Parliament. This cannot happen. The Scottish people have spoken and the Scottish Government has acted. There will be no fracking in Scotland. All the parties in this chamber, except for the Tories, are in favour of this action, proving once again that the best interests of Scotland cannot be trusted in the hands of the Conservatives. The SNP's record today and in our last 10 years of government proves the exact opposite. Today we act in the best interests of Scots, in the best interests of our climate and in the best interests of our future as a nation. Thank you. Thank you. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Graham Day. Mr Finlay, please. Thanks, thanks President Officer. Since the earliest days of the Industrial Revolution, the demand for energy has increased exponentially. And areas uh, of my region have been at the centre of Scotland's energy production, coal production in mid and West Lothian and the world's oil industry began in West Lothian with the shale oil works. And for 10 years, we've had one of the country's biggest wind farms at Black Law, which opened the floodgates to one of the greatest missed opportunities of our times in renewables. So for well over a century, some of the communities in my region have taken a disproportionate share of the impact of energy production, often leaving a legacy of ill health, environmental degradation and pollution. And it's these com communities, more often than not the poorest communities, that are all too often subjected to unwelcome planning applications and land use, land use decisions. Developments like open cast uh, coal sites, landfill, waste processing and the over-concentration of wind farms. Not for some grand principle of providing cheap, renewable, clean energy, but more often than not, little more than the latest opportunity for financial speculation by multinationals and venture capitalists. These Renewable projects should have been locally and publicly owned and run with profits recycled back into the host communities. And of course, it's these communities that would be most affected if we had fracking. I've, I've opposed fracking from the outset precisely for that reason. The fracking community uh, companies would be just the latest in a long line of speculators who come into the community promising riches, jobs and benefits only to leave a legacy of environmental damage degraded countryside and little, if any, community benefit. It may come as a surprise to some, but any of us aren't particularly well known for their philanthropic behaviour. They are known for holding the country to ransom by threatening to close down their biggest refinery. They're known for using their muscle to shaft the workforce. And they're known for using their private monopoly to try and undermine a legitimate and responsible trade union for the crime of protecting their members' livelihoods. And it's any of us who have the most to gain snapping up licences across the central belt in the north of England. Scottish Government ministers met the company on a dozen occasions in the run-up to the original moratorium. Maybe now we can have the details of those conversations released in the interests of transparency, but I won't hold my breath. I've actively opposed fracking because I've looked in depth at what it has done to communities elsewhere, polluting the water table, affecting the land and food chain, causing public health concerns. 100,000 wells drilled in the US since 2005 using 280 billion 
gallons of water, which becomes heavily polluted during the process. These are uh, very serious concerns and they have, a, uh, have had an uh, important impact on water supply, on rivers, plant and animal life, and ultimately on human health. And a whole host of other concerns have been raised about contaminated water, illegal dumping of water, uh, and wastewater being given to livestock feeding into the food chain, and also aquifer contamination and air pollution. Uh, I don't want to see a single community here affected by this, but I also don't want to see another community in the US or anywhere else affected by it. Let's be clear, it's the political pressure that came about, both from Claudia Beamish's bill and huge public opposition, that has forced the government to act. But we don't have a ban, just a continued moratorium. Prior to the announcement of that moratorium, we had almost radio silence from government backbenchers. Hardly one of them speaking out demanding a ban. But lo and behold, when the continued moratorium was announced, all of a sudden, those silent, compliant and dutiful backbenchers have found their voices, telling the world they have all been opposed to fracking all along. Well, if we are, no thank you. Well, if we're now, if we're now in favour of a ban, if we're now in favour of a ban, well, then you go, Miss Martin, if we've got time, I'll take, a, take your intervention. I'll take your intervention if you've got time. Right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Neil Finlay does not watch the SNP party conference. But if he were to look back, I'm right, aren't I? But if he were to look back, how many times has fracking been mentioned and overwhelmingly passed by a claim of ban on fracking in the SNP party conference? Neil Finlay. How many times have we debated it in here and how many times have we had radio silence from backbenchers of your party? Every time, silence. And I... And if we're now all in favour of a ban, and I welcome that, I absolutely welcome it now, if we're all in favour of a ban, except the Tories, and I include Fergus Ewan in that, that description, then let us take every step that this Parliament allows to make it a real ban, and let us see the government show its commitment by ensuring that that is as tight as possible. If you do that, you'll incur the wrath of Jim Ratcliffe, you'll incur the wrath of Ineos, you'll incur the wrath of the Tory party and probably Fergus as well. But you will get my support. I believe you'll get the support of the overwhelming majority of members of this parliament. And in doing so, we'll join France, Bulgaria and several US states in legally saying no to fracking. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I call Graham Day to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Day, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, when it comes time to reflect upon my tenure as an MSP, and I, I do hope that will be sometime well into the future, uh, October the 3rd, 2017, will stand out as a genuine highlight. It was, of course, the day that Paul Wheelhouse and I Scotland would, subject to the support of Parliament, not permit uh, Scotland would not permit, permit fracking on its soil. As an implacable opponent of hydraulic fracturing in Scotland, it was a decision I warmly welcomed. When the moratorium was announced, I forecast in this chamber that any robust examination of the evidence available from across the globe would lead us to this point. It was therefore something of a relief, not only that it did, but that I was spared the possibility of having to vote against the Scottish Government position. Because had we today been debating allowing fracking, I would not only have been speaking against the motion, but at decision time, voting against it. For me, for environmental and climate change reasons, fracking is not something we should go anywhere near. But October the 3rd was personally memorable for another reason. That was the evening I, along with Claudia Beamish and Angus MacDonald, had the enormous privilege of being in the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle to see Christina Figueres presented with the Shackleton Medal to honour her enormous contribution to, uh, to having the world finally recognise its responsibilities in tackling climate change. More importantly, we heard an utterly inspirational speech from her. I had the further privilege of having a brief chat with Ms Figueres. Now, I won't breach a confidence here, although I suspect she wouldn't be concerned if I did, and reveal the specific detail of what we discussed and what she had to say. But let's just say she was well cited on the fracking decision. And her message was simple. Well done, Scotland. Keep on doing what you're doing. Now, I recognise that other voices raised in opposition to this decision. But me, I stand with the architect of the Paris Climate Agreement on this. And of course, Christina Figueres isn't the only globally respected figure to have endorsed this decision. Former would-be US presidential contender, Senator Bernie Saunders, who's seen firsthand the impact of fracking across the pond, praised Scotland and challenged his own country to follow our lead. 
We have all followed tales of the impacts of fracking in the USA, where it has been practised for a decade or so. And Let us look at the changes in emission figures in that time. One study has highlighted a 30 per cent increase in atmospheric methane concentrations between 2002 and 2014 in the US. Although the paper does not attempt to identify the source of methane, this period coincides with the development of unconventional oil and gas. And a further study has estimated that 40 per cent of recent growth in atmospheric methane between 2007 and 2014 can be attributed to oil and gas activities. I would argue that offers a pretty sound reason for supporting this ban. Now, we're told by the UK onshore oil and gas uh, in, in choosing to ban domestic onshore exploration, the Scottish Government is turning its back on a potential 3,000 jobs and $6.5 billion of economic benefit. Yet the economic impact research conducted by KPMG concludes that direct and indirect economic benefit combined through to 2062 uh, would amount to only $3.4 billion cumulatively, maximum, and the number of related jobs, direct and indirect, would peak at 1,400. Not insignificant, but nowhere near the figures speculated by UCOG, who, with due respect, do have a vested interest here. And the fact is, Scotland's already committed to an energy future that brings with it financial and jobs benefits. Indeed, we're already well down that road. The renewable sector is currently reckoned to have a turnover of £5 billion and supports 26,000 jobs. And why would we jeopardise the natural environment, which, whatever other value we place on it, is, as Ash Denham noted, worth £20 billion a year to our economy and supports 60,000 direct jobs? Presiding officer, having committed ourselves to a low carbon future, then surely the focus must remain on transitioning away from fossil fuel use and increasing our renewable generation. It was revealed as Parliament rose for recess that on the first Monday of October, wind turbines in Scotland generated more than double the electricity the country used on that day. And just last week, the First Minister opened the world's first floating wind farm, which will generate enough power for around 20,000 homes. If we can remove the blockages to offshore generation in the first, the fourth and day, then we can really hit our targets in this area of renewable energy generation and in a cost-effective way. UK government research has shown that renewables have the potential to become more cost-effective uh, as a generation source than con uh, conventional gas-fired power stations by the, the mid-2020s. The lifetime cost of onshore wind is estimated to fall to £63 per megawatt hour generated below the comparable cost for gas in the same time frame. Offshore wind costs are also estimated to reduce becoming competitive with gas by 2030. Presiding officer, we don't need to frack. For the good of the environment, we should not frack. In a few minutes' time, let's make it clear, Scotland will not frack. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Day. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr McPherson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, there is a legitimate debate to be had here, uh, but it's proved now impossible to cut through the rhetoric, hostility and, quite frankly, nonsense which seems to characterise any discussion of fracking. And, and I hope to try and bring a little bit of light to a debate that has so far contained rather more heat. I think, first of all, we should be clear on what hydraulic fracturing is. Uh, put simply, it's just the process of injecting liquid at high pressure into rock deep underground, forcing open existing fissures within the rock, allowing oil and gas trapped within it to be forced to the surface. Although often described as unconventional oil and gas extraction, this is something of a misnomer. Fracking is neither a new nor a particularly unconventional method. The first, uh, the first use of fracking in the UK was back in 1965, and by the late 70s, was common throughout the North Sea and the world. Frankly, the technology behind the high wind floating wind farm project that the First Minister recently opened last week, which is really, really interesting as it is, is decidedly more unconventional than fracking is. One of the most commonly expressed fears, and that has been expressed today about fracking, is the use of chemical additives in the fluid used to fracture the rocks. However, these days, more than 99% of the fluid volume tends to be water and sand. So chemical additives equate to less than 1%. And these additives tend to be polyacrylamides, which are deemed to be non-harmful. There's unquestionably been instances where lax regulation and poor envi environmental protections have led to the use of inappropriate chemicals in the fracking process. But this is a failure of regulation and monitoring, not of science. And even among the scientists and experts commissioned by the Scottish Government, there's a strong body of opinion which believes that it's possible to have successful onshore fracking programme in Scotland with a strong regulatory and monitoring framework. Presenting officer, it is right that we take the utmost care when making decisions like this. 
We must always balance risk against reward and consider what can be done to mitigate that risk. But all too often with these issues, we are reduced to a simplistic level that debate is all but useless. Now, wind power is frequently held up as the epitome of clean, environmentally friendly electricity. But like every form of energy production, it does have its negatives. Now, I'm supporting constituents at the moment living close to wind farm who experience issues with water boreholes failing or becoming contaminated as a result of turbine installations. If you pour hundreds of thousands of tonnes of concrete into the ground, and, do, and you don't have to be Archimedes to recognise there is a significant potential for disruption to the water table and local, local water courses, not to mention water contamination. So no form of any production is risk-free, and the Scottish Government has demonstrated it's perfectly happy to accept a degree of risk, but only when it fits with the narrow view of progress. As already been mentioned on nuclear power, they'll allow no, new, new, no nuclear power stations, but let the old ones keep running because, while Scotland needs the base load in the grid to offset the instability of one power, they don't want the hassle the anti-nuclear lobby will generate at any suggestion of building a new, safer, more efficient, cleaner nuclear reactors. Or in GM crops, no research here, because while we're rightly proud of our globally recognised talent in biological science sector, the Scottish Government would prefer not to incur the wrath of the anti-GM campaigners for whom no regulatory system could be stringent enough to prevent uh, the upcoming apocalypse, in their view. We're seeing the same thing again with fracking. Rather than exploring the opportunity to secure a source of energy and jobs, albeit with a cautious approach to rolling it out, the Scottish Government chooses to slam the door shut and seek praise for the quality of its lock. And, presiding officer, if, if only self-righteousness was an energy source, we could all huddle round Paul Wheelhouse and his cohorts and keep warm. <laughs> and it's no wonder, it's no wonder the SNP are so happy to put up wind farms everywhere. It reminds them of themselves and the way they turn in whatever direction the wind happens to be blowing at that time. <laughs> Renewables are undoubtedly where most of or not all of our power will come from in the hopefully not too distant future. But we cannot meet those grand ambitions in a single leap. This is a journey and we need to be pragmatic about the steps we take to reach our final goal. Personally, I would like to see a greater research into hydrogen cell fuel technology as it's arguably a more sustainable power system for electric vehicles than batteries and means charging. On all these issues, there's nothing but silence from the Scottish Government. I mean, the I'm members in his last, last 30 minute. seconds. Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. This isn't a comment about scientists being ignorant or a dismissal of experts. His point was that science is about embracing doubt, about being open to the possibility that you might be wrong. That is why science has trials. That's why they conduct tests and experiments. It might be wrong, but it's still important to try and research and develop to improve. But time and again, the Scottish Government shy away from this. Time and again, they choose to drive a policy based on upsetting the fewest number of people for the shortest amount of time. Please conclude. Okay, whatever your position and merits of fracking, we should be wary, presiding officer, of taking decisions with long-term implications based on the fear of short-term repercussions. I call Ben McPherson and then move to closing speeches. Thank you, presiding officer. I, like many, most of the chamber, uh, welcome this Government, Scottish Government's proposition for an, a strict and effective ban on fracking, using planning powers to ensure applications for unconventional oil and gas extraction are considered in line with that Scottish Government position, that very strong position that fracking cannot and will not take place in Scotland. This decision is a victory for campaigners and communities, including the many campaigners in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith, and I too pay tribute to the Our Fourth campaigners. It is a victory for the long-term public health, environmental sustainability and economic interests of Scotland. It is a victory based on evidence, a geological survey, a climate change impact assessment, a health impact assessment and, crucially, an economic impact assessment as well. Because those who argue in favour of fracking on economic grounds forget the crucial political philosophical point that Policy should always be about more than the basis of GDP. It should be around the common good of Scotland and the society and economy that we're trying to build. And the Tory opposition to this ban is just another demonstration of their economic incompetence. Their, the old story of a quick buck 
that runs through the Tory political philosophy has been clear for all to see today in this debate. Research from KPMG has stated that fracking would contribute very little to the economy in the short term. It would only contribute on average 0.1% of GDP, only 1.2 billion over the decades that would go ahead. Put that in comparison to the tourism industry, for example, that could be impacted by fracking, which has an annual, in, in, an annual revenue of 11 billion pounds to the Scottish economy and makes up 4.2% of GDP. Compare that Tory position with LSE research that a no-deal position from the Tories on Brexit would see Scotland use, lose 30 billion GVA. And changes to subsidy arrangements and renewables have put one in six renewables jobs at risk and continue to negatively impact our growing and strong renewables industry. And that's why I'll strongly support the Liberal Democrat amendment today. Because as WWF have said, if Scotland were to allow fracking, that would fly in the face of a much welcomed ambition, an ambition that the Tories apparently support of securing half of all of Scotland's energy needs from renewables by 2030. Because we need to support our renewables energy sector, a sector that has the capacity to generate much more onshore wind resource, a part of the, the renewable sector that the Tories have been damaging through their bad decisions on the contract for different subsidy arrangement at Westminster. We have 25% of Europe's tidal energy resource, 10% of Europe's wave energy resource, and 25% of its offshore wind resource. We don't need fracking. We have huge renewable potential in Scotland still to utilise. I also support the Labour Amendment and the Green Amendments, which will strengthen the position and build on the legally robust, evidence-based approach that the Scottish Government have taken. This decision that I hope Parliament will make tonight is a move in favour of the next generation as well as the benefit of the status quo. It is a move to low carbon technology being the most important investment for our economic and technological energy progress. It is a move to protect the environment. It is a move to help tackle climate change. And it will also represent the democratic, last minute. It will also represent the democratic will. The democratic will of the Scottish people who voted primarily for political parties who were sceptical of fracking. It is, will be the democratic will as expressed in the 60,000 consultation responses that were made. And I note that only 1% of those responses uh, we're in favour of fracking and the Tories are in favour of fracking. Does this demonstrate once and for all that the Tories only stand up for the 1% in our society? Uh, so in Parliament today, let's send a clear message that this Parliament opposes fracking, both now and in the future, not just for the benefit of those of us today, but for the benefit of our environment, the wider economy and the development of our economy, public health and the common good. Please support the motion. Thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur in closing speeches to close the Liberal Democrats' five minutes or thereabouts, please, Mr Thank MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's been a strange debate. Angus Mac uh, Macdonald wanted to take us back to the Ethan epoch, complaining that this debate had not been scheduled uh, 50 billion years ago, a point he may wish to take up with the Bureau in due course. Murdo Fraser, uh, acting as the self-appointed spokesperson for the GMB and Jim Sillers in a political realignment not seen <laughs> since the Eocene epoch. Uh, but anyway, the, the background to, to, to this uh, debate around this issue in Parliament, I think, was helpfully set out by Claudia Beamish, uh, reflecting on um, the, the passage of her members' uh, bill. Uh, the vote in this Parliament secured support from um, ourselves, from Labour and from the, the Greens. Um, but also, I think, a number of members, Mark Ruskell and others, have pointed to the development of the consensus out with this building uh, and the work done by a number of NGOs, but a number also of very uh, genuine community and grassroots uh, organisations. I, I said in my opening speech, I, I very much uh, understand and sympathise with the frustration that they have felt about the, the length of time it's taken to get to this point. I'm sure many of them will continue campaigning on this issue, but I think it's worth putting on record uh, the, their contribution to getting us to where we are now. Uh, the four areas, I think, of concern that, that were reflected um, in, in all speeches uh, this afternoon uh, were, were in the broad categories of health, social, environmental and economic impacts 
of fracking. The Minister, uh, I think, was right in, in, in opening up the debate to remind us of the position taken by Health Improvement Scotland in, the, in light of the epidemiological impacts uh, being so uncertain. A precautionary principle really was only, uh, the only appropriate uh, approach. In relation to the, the social impacts, I think we had testimony and insights from uh, frontline communities, Angus Macdonald, Neil Finlay, Ben McPherson and others, I think pointed to the, uh, the, the, the emotions within these communities about the impact that fracking might have, not least in relation to, to housing. And I think Claudia Beamish drew uh, quite rightly the parallel with um, many of these uh, communities who are still enduring the ongoing impacts of the open cast uh, mining industry. Uh, but perhaps inevitably uh, the focus of much of the debate was around the, the second two areas here, environmental and economic. And uh, while I, I think a series of, of uh, contributors from the Tory uh, benches drew, um, drew attention to what they saw was a lack of scientific evidence uh, for the uh, position adopted by the government and backed uh, by other parties in this chamber. Uh, I think the Minister was also right to point to the fact that the Tories appeared to be supportive of fracking even before they gathered the evidence, evidence let alone uh, public views uh, upon this issue. And I think that it's fair to say that scientific evidence on this is always going to have an area of, of doubt about it. Public policy needs to be framed, uh, guided by science, uh, but reflecting the fact that scientific evidence uh, comes in many forms. But the UK Committee on Climate Change has been consistent in its warnings uh, about the likely rise in emissions, the risk uh, to our climate change targets, and or the uh, offsetting effects of needing to make emissions reductions uh, elsewhere. And I think Mark Ruskell again was right to say the displacement here would be more from coal than it would be more from renewables than it would be uh, from uh, coal and an energy future where it's uh, secure, sustainable and affordable, then renewable storage, energy efficiency and demand reduction has to be the direction uh, we are going in. Uh, renewables in terms of uh, job creation as well, the economic impacts there are far more profound and important uh, in terms of jobs and wealth creation uh, than, uh, than is the case with uh, fracking. The KPG, KPMG report was cited by many and I think that shines a light on the extent to which uh, perhaps the benefits, uh, the economic benefits of fracking uh, have been overstated. And, and it would appear that Murdo Fraser and some of his colleagues uh, appear happy um, to ban onshore wind uh, but let rip fracking. So don't want a, a wind farm either in your back garden or your back field, but quite happy to see fracking taking place underneath your uh, community uh, or village. And I, I think the Tories do need to be clear where they would see the sectors bearing the impact of the offsetting emissions actually falling, because that, I think, is a tangible um, effect on, on what the economic impact of, of allowing fracking to take place would be. Now, as somebody who was refereed by uh, John Underhill uh, when he was refereeing in the East of Scotland League, I can say with some certainty I didn't always degree, agree uh, with the decisions he made, but I would uh, bow to his, uh, his understanding of matters geological, and I think he's quite right to suggest that the, uh, the economic benefits uh, of fracking have been overstated uh, for a number of very uh, sensible geological reasons. So I, I think in conclusion, for environmental, economic, health and social reasons, uh, we should not be opening up a new carbon front. Uh, and if fracking is the fag end of the carbon economy, uh, it's time to quit. And I look forward to Parliament uh, break, uh, backing this ban this evening through the government motion and through backing the Lib Dem, Labour and Green amendments. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr McArthur. I call Alison Johnson. Close to the Greens. Five minutes or thereabouts, please, Ms Johnson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's often said that politicians are behind the curve when it comes to public opinion, but it seems that we're 55 million years behind the geological reality, according to Harriet Watts, chief scientist, Professor Underhill, as noted by Angus MacDonald this afternoon. Presiding officer, it's been over two years since I first moved a motion in this chamber highlighting the significant public opposition to new methods of fossil fuel extraction, such as fracking, and calling on the Parliament to implement a ban on unconventional fossil fuel extraction in Scotland to protect our communities, who I can't thank enough for their involvement opposing us, our environment, and respect our international climate change commitments. And now, at that time, not one other party in this chamber supported my call. And that day, Shale Gas International gleefully declared the Green Party failed to ban fracking in Scotland yesterday, <laughs> and that 
Alison Johnston argued that a ban on unconventional gas in Scotland would focus attention on truly renewable energy sources rather than scraping the bottom of the fossil fuels barrel. She also rejected claims that exploration of shale gas deposits will lower household energy bills, saying that consumers are being offered false hope, as I do today, presiding officer. The article went on to say that John Swinney, then Finance Secretary, Labour's Ian Gray and Tory MSP Murdo Fraser all rejected her call for a ban. Now, I warmly welcome the fact that four out of five parties in this chamber are firmly opposing this technology today. I would politely um, point out to Mr Finlay that you voted against my motion calling for a ban on fracking on the 7th of May 2014. <laughs> Presiding officer, Greens have always recognised the uncertainties and risks fracking and other new fossil fuel technologies posed. The government's research during the moratorium has strengthened that case, pointing to the lack of evidence needed to assure us that the public health risk is negligible, and the economic case was also found to be weaker than expected. And while that evidence gathering period was underway, Greens and others have been on the front line, standing shoulder to shoulder with the Scot central Scotland communities who'd be most impacted by fracking. I've spent time with many others in packed community halls where the public raised their concerns with developers, with our fourth, with concerned communities of Falkirk and many more. I've lodged motions, looked back, they gained meagre support, numerous parliamentary questions highlighting the risks of this industry. And Greens, Greens also came close to securing a two kilometre buffer zone between communities and fracking developments when the last national planning framework was up for discussion. I almost won that vote in committee, um, but, but the convener's vote swung it. And I do commend Murdo Fraser on being consistent on this issue, although he is consistently wrong. <laughs> now, I welcome the government's announcement that it will ban fracking, but as Mark Gruskell has highlighted, we need to ensure that the ban extends beyond the lifetime of this government and is subject to robust parliamentary scrutiny. Placing a clear statement opposing fracking in the upcoming national planning framework will ensure that the ban can't simply be overturned by a future minister's signature on a letter to planning authorities, but must undergo cross-party scrutiny in Parliament. And for that reason, we will be supporting the Labour amendment, which, along with our own, notes the importance of using the national planning framework to ensure that long-term ban. Um, Liam MacArthur rightly noted that our future lies in investing in our renewable energy industries and Greens will also be supporting the Liberal Democrat amendment today. The Green amendment today goes further. It calls for the Scottish Government to use its powers over oil and gas licensing when these are transferred from the UK Government. We must use the full range of powers that are available to us to ensure that the ban against fracking remains in place for generations ahead. For those that will argue that gas might be lower carbon than coal, fair enough, but it is a stretch too far to place that within the low carbon economy. That's like saying, do you know what, I'd like to lose weight, so I'll forgo a fresh cream cake and I'll just have a wee plate of chocolate biscuits instead <laughs> and pretending that that is health food. It is a stopgap. It's one that would divert much needed skills and investment from our abundant renewables. Fossil fuels are estimated by the International Energy Agency to receive subsidies of £380 billion a year. If only similar incentives were offered to develop renewables, it astonishes me that the so-called party of big business doesn't get the economics. No wonder your tree is no longer green. <laughs> renewables can sustain livelihoods and communities and provide for our energy needs for the long term. And as the minister noted, Lord Brown, chair of the fracking company Codrilla and a key UK government advisor, and of course, Professor John Underhill, they have agreed that the economic opportunities of fra fracking are overhyped. Presiding officer, I'll wrap up there. I will be supporting the Green Amendment. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey, close for Labour, six minutes or thereabouts, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, there's no doubt we're heavily reliant on gas for our energy needs. It accounts for some 55% of our energy consumption and is likely to be just as important in the future for energy, for heating and for the petrochemical industry. So we need to look ahead to forecast future needs and challenges. Demand is forecast to remain roughly the same for the next 20 years, according to the Department for Energy and Climate Change. We know that currently about 50% of our gas is imported from places like Norway and Belgium, but also from places like Qatar. Security of supply 
must be an issue that should concern us in the medium and long term, so that we guard against our supply being vulnerable to instability in some of the countries from whom we import gas. So over-reliance on imports does not give us security of supply. But all of that said, I don't think that onshore fracking is the answer. There are a number of different approaches we need to take. But my starting point is that everything we do has to be seen in the context of the climate change strategy and statutory targets that we, as a parliament, all agreed. So reducing demand and consumption has a part to play, as does pursuing new opportunities offshore, where we have been fracking for some time. We shouldn't let up on our focus on renewables either, because renewables, although they will not provide for all of our energy needs, they are an increasing and welcome part of our energy mix. So in that overall context, it does seem to me a little bit perverse that we should want to use another fossil fuel which would run contrary to everything we've said in this chamber. Now, the Scottish Government rightly, in my view, commissioned six expert reports covering everything from health impacts to an economic impact assessment. Others have touched on health and the environment, and I don't want to repeat that, but I want to talk exclusively about the economic impact. Now, I think many of us in this chamber, contrary to what others might think, are actually quite pragmatic. You know, if the jobs and economic growth had been significant, we would have needed to weigh that up very carefully indeed. At a time when the economy is flatlining, we should, of course, consider the potential advantages. But it is ultimately about striking a balance between environmental and economic interests in the long term. Now, there were many claims, many of them stellar claims, made for the economic benefits of fracking for jobs in our economy. There were many claims made about what it would deliver in the form of cheap fuel that would help us tackle fuel poverty. And don't get me wrong, both of these are attractive propositions. But unfortunately, the claims tended to be far greater than the actual reality. Investing in onshore fracking does not grow the economy by a significant margin. And let's consider the KPMG report. If we went for fracking, the estimated spend in Scotland over the next 45 years would be £2.2 billion. That's £48 million a year. The lowest estimate of total Scottish spend is £0.5 billion, and that's £11 million a year. That's not a huge amount of money. If you then consider the tax take, something that should now interest, interest us all in this parliament, the tax yield would be £1.4 billion across the UK for spend over 45 years. In Scotland, you would get a Barnet share of about 140 million over 45 years. Now just pause and work that out. 140 million over 45 years is about three million pounds a year. This is not going to make a significant difference. Peak employment is about 1,400 jobs. The lowest estimate is 470 jobs. Not all of those jobs are for the entirety of the 45 years, but will depend on production and scale of development. So whilst this is undoubtedly better than having no jobs, this plus the tax take and the spend in the economy needs to be set against potential environmental impacts and the key question of whether this is worth the risk. And there are risks, some of which have been outlined by Neil Finlay and others in their contribution to the chamber. So I'm not convinced that with the numbers in the KPMG report, this represents such a significant economic impact that we should proceed with fracking. Others say that fracking will provide us with a cheap form of fuel and we should be able to tackle fuel poverty. Nobody would wish that more than me, but I note the observation in the Royal Society of Edinburgh's paper, whose briefing was particularly helpful, that actually it would not be any cheaper as we are part of the open market. Finally, presiding officer, much mention has been made in this debate about respecting the science. And I wholeheartedly agree with the proposition that this should be an evidence-based parliament. But it is not the only consideration for this parliament. It is for parliamentarians to weigh up all the evidence, the science, the economic impact, 
and the view of the public. Their voice should also be heard in this debate because they will be the ones who live with this in their communities. Presiding officer, Labour has wholeheartedly supported the Members' Bill put forward by my colleague, Claudia Beamish. I think it has been undoubtedly very helpful in encouraging the Scottish Government to do more. And I am pleased that this evening, the Scottish Government will accept our amendment that places fracking within the national planning framework so that it can't be changed at a whim by ministers, but requires a vote of this Parliament to overturn. A step short of a legislative ban, but nevertheless, very welcome and something we're pleased to support. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. I call now Alexander Burnett, close to the Conservatives. Six minutes, please, or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, the SNP's position on fracking has been nothing short of impractical and badly principled. And sadly, nothing in this debate has shown it to be otherwise. For years now, the SNP have dithered on fracking, and now swathes of a central belt will miss out on what should have been the gold rush of this century. So as has been pointed out, community benefit of over 600 million could have been ploughed into these areas. New schools built, new playing fields created, and community centres upgraded. Yet instead, the SNP have turned their backs on Scotland and put their own political agenda ahead of scientific evidence. Now, not only is it the central belt they are letting down, but thousands of skilled workers from the oil and gas industry, particularly in the northeast, will have another door of opportunity slammed in their faces. So perhaps Labour might reflect on this the next time they speak of energy sector job losses. For as Dean Lockhart correctly pointed out, reversing this decision would have attracted six and a half billion of investment, created over 3,000 jobs, and generated nearly four billion in tax revenues. So shame on the Scottish Government for turning down a fantastic chance for so many Scots. High quality, highly skilled jobs, which would have taken in Scottish talent and boosted our young people's chances and aspirations. And these skills will now develop in England. So Labour's position again is all over the shop, but not reflecting the shop floor. So Claudia Beamish and her colleagues now choose to side with the Greens, and it would appear they only listen to their unions when they want to stop rather than create work. But this debate was not just about communities and the economy missing out, but also our environment. And yet, even on this subject, Mark Ruskell and the Greens' position smacks of hypocrisy. We know that a shift of... <laughs> we know that a shift to natural gas from coal has cut more than two billion tonnes of CO2 in the last decade. This is over 70% more successful than emissions reduced through renewable energy. And even the former leader of Greenpeace has said that the movement needs to have an urgent rethink over energy sources. But the demands for gas are not just about energy. There is a huge lack of understanding about the industry which produces the products which we use in our everyday lives. Without the chemicals produced at Grangemouth, it is nearly impossible to get through a day without using multiple products derived from gas. Such products from shampoo, clothing, contact lenses and washing powder all contain gas derivatives. Now, I'm not sure about the rest of the chamber, but I, for one, am keen to maintain a basic level of hygiene. So whether for energy or product, <laughs> denying Scotland the security of its own supply is also denying the savings to our consumers. From fuel poverty to rising household expenses, the consequences of this decision will be costly. And yet the SNP know this and continue to import 40,000 barrels of frac shale gas every day. And as one of my colleagues noted, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has pointed out that the global carbon footprint of the gas that Scotland imports will be far higher than for any onshore production in Scotland. Utter hypocrisy, Deputy Presiding Officer. But the SNP don't care for facts and are happy for it to happen somewhere else, as long as it isn't in their backyard. As Murdo Fraser pointed out, a point ignored by the Minister and his colleagues in their offerings today, that senior members of the SNP and members of their own scientific panel have real concerns over this decision and call for proper engagement with the industry. 
So why will they hold a poll comprising of two lobbying groups over the balanced evidence that my colleague Jamie Green calls for? We need to carefully consider what sort of message this ill-thought-out ban sends to the world. Academics, scientists and engineers now know that the SNP government is not for knowledge and expertise and would put political posturing first. So forget about talking Scotland down. This is letting Scotland down. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a massively missed opportunity. At the SNP party conference, they spoke of progress. But is it progress to deny these communities a chance? Is it progress to stop thousands of jobs being created? Is it progress to ignore the scientists and academics? And is it progress to ban something only to import it from elsewhere? No, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's just sheer hypocrisy. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Burnett. You have some spare time. Uh, Mr Wheelhouse, Minister, to wind up the government up to 5.15, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And we are reaching the culmination of nearly four years of carefully considered investigation into unconventional oil and gas. Uh, unlike the, the, the uh, characterisation of the members uh, to my left, I, I, I wish to thank the members of the Chamber for a lively and informed debate, for the most part, a well-informed debate uh, today. Throughout this process, we have been fully committed to engaging in a balanced, informed debate with the public, stakeholders and Parliament. Um, I, I just uh, taken in breath was taken away by Alex, uh, Alistair, uh, Alexander Burnett, sorry, uh, closing remarks there, suggesting this was an opinion poll. We specifically said it was not an opinion poll, but it was a consultation open to the, all the people of Scotland, stakeholders, indeed internationally, um, and 60,500 people took part, including many... People did take part from internationally uh, in, in the consultation, but we have um, specifically focused, as I'm sure members will understand, on the responses from those men in Scotland. I have indeed heard enough from, from the Conservative benches today, uh, and I will respond. I will respond. I will respond to the points. I will, however, respond to the points that have been raised by Conservative members in debate, so they're not going to be forgotten. But throughout this process, we've been fully committed, as I say, to a balanced informed debate. We've clearly and transparently sought out and made publicly available impartial independent research evidence, including science, on the potential impacts of unconventional oil and gas. We've encouraged and empowered everyone with an interest to express their views and that evidence. We recognised that this is a complex and highly technical issue. And we took steps, a number of innovative steps indeed, to encourage participation in our public consultation. And I want to thank, as other members have done, specific groups, I want to thank everybody, whether they were for or against unconventional oil and gas, for taking part in, in the exercises we've commissioned and for the expert evidence that's been provided to us. We have scrutinised that evidence and we have carefully considered the response to our consultation. And on the 3rd of October, we set out a position and put in place a robust and effective ban on unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. Uh, but, presiding officer, a decision on unconventional oil and gas in Scotland does not exist in isolation. It must be viewed within the context of our longer term ambitions for energy. A number of members have uh, made that point, and I, I fully recognise it. Uh, also, in re respect of manufacturing and the Scottish economy more generally, and of course, our climate change responsibilities. Uh, Jackie Bailey made a number of very important points about offshore oil and gas. She's absolutely right. It's an important industry to support. It does provide three quarters of our primary energy needs. And, we do require uh, to support the industry. Offshore oil uh, production uh, of oil and gas in the North Sea has developed over the last half century as a highly regulated industry with some of the most advanced and comparatively least polluting production methods in the world. And that is why an industry supporting over 100,000 jobs exists in Scotland. I will in a moment, uh, if, if Mr Harvey will forgive me. Uh, Jackie Bailey was also right that a strong and vibrant domestic offshore oil and gas industry can play a positive role uh, in the future. And we certainly want to see that role being played in terms of low carbon transition. I believe the skill sets will migrate across to low carbon activities in due course as well. But the demands of our energy infrastructure will change dramatically in the decades ahead. And these, as these changes unfold, we will have a moral responsibility to tackle climate change and an economic responsibility to prepare Scotland for new low carbon opportunities and a social responsibility to help those in most need access affordable energy. And in our final energy strategy, we will outline the role that gas infrastructure could play in that future energy system, including the opportunities for heat networks, low carbon or zero uh, gases such as biogas and hydrogen. Uh, in this context, I note with the interest the UK government's clean growth strategy and its renewed, if rather belated, but welcome, interest in carbon capture usage and storage. 
And under the right conditions, this technology has the potential to support a new industry in Scotland that would not only exploit Scotland's geological and industrial resources, but would do so while contributing to our mission to tackle climate change. We will work to ensure that UK funding for industrial decarbonisation reflects the scale of ambition for important Scottish industrial clusters, such as at Grangemouth, as well as ambition for new low-carbon uh, sectors within the economy. Presiding officer, uh, achieving our vision for energy is also crucial to our efforts to tackle fuel poverty. And uh, as announced by the First Minister, the Scottish Government is developing plans for an energy supply company that will support uh, with our efforts to, to tackle fuel poverty and help to achieve our ambitious climate change targets. Um, a number of mentions, I mentioned John Brown, Lord Brown, uh, myself, uh, Alison Johnson, just very recently mentioned him as well. I just want to give the actual quote that Lord uh, Brown has actually mentioned, bearing in mind he was the former chairman of Quadrilla. And he said, we are part of a well-connected European gas market, and unless it is a gigantic amount of gas, it is not going to have a material impact on price. KPMG further went on to say, it is worth noting that given limited recoverable volumes, UK uh, un unconventional oil and gas outputs would only represent a fraction of the supply to the global market. Uh, furthermore, the scale of development in Scotland will be much lower than that in the US, and hence Scottish unconventional oil and gas is unlikely to have an impact on global energy prices. And this finding suggests that there would be no noticeable effect on energy costs for households. I notice the Conservatives have not made that point today any, to any extent. I think they already know the game is up on that point. They have made it very loudly since the 3rd of October, so hopefully they'll finally be convinced. Uh, I'll bring in Mr Harvey, if I may. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, it, it was relating to an earlier point that the, the minister made about offshore oil and gas. When, he, in a previous role, he had responsibility for climate change, he was one of the few people within the SNP who accepted the basic principle that the majority of existing fossil fuel reserves are going to have to be left in the ground, just as we're doing now with onshore shale reserves. Has he come to a view yet as to what proportion of existing fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground unburned in order to achieve our climate change objectives? Minister. I'm, I'm happy to take, uh, take a discussion with that point with Mr Harvey in due course, but I really want to focus on the debate we're having today, which is about not creating a new source of, un uh, through unconventional oil and gas, a new source of uh, low carb, uh, high carbon uh, energy. Um, but looking beyond um, the, the energy strategy, uh, Scotland's manufacturing chemicals industry continues to play a crucial role in the economy, and uh, we will continue to give that industry strong support. Now, turning to the points that have been made in my final few minutes um, that have been made by members, I just want to highlight a, a, a few that, that have been made by the Conservatives to start with. Um, I said in response to Murdo Fraser that he had failed to acknowledge that 63% of gas produced in the UK is produced in Scotland by 8.5% of the population. Um, Scotland is a net exporter of gas, Mr Fraser, and although we do import uh, ethane to, to, to help with Ineos and Grangemouth, we are a significant exporter of gas. And I, I think members were probably shocked, those who weren't in the chamber should know that the point I mentioned, the biggest threat to the Scottish economy being Brexit, Mr Fraser was laughing yeah, at that point, yeah. failing to acknowledge the 80,000 jobs that may be put at risk by a hard yeah. Brexit, and also ignoring the evidence in today's Herald, which suggests up to 30 billion of impact on the Scottish economy, uh, totally ignored by the Conservatives in their response. But, but if, if the Conservatives believe that economic impact is important, they should acknowledge that and they should be acting now to prevent a hard Brexit. Claudia Beamish, um, I want to pay tribute to Claudia Beamish. We may be in a different position in terms that she would have set out um, initially to intend to, to have a ban. I want to endorse the position of the Labour Amendment, indeed the Green Amendment and the Liberal Democrats today. We will take steps to enshrine uh, this position, subject to the strategic environmental assessment, we will take steps to enshrine this position in the national planning framework. But I want to thank uh, Claudia Beamish for her courtesy and her engagement with you on this issue and her hard work in terms of delivering her consultation. Uh, I will happily discuss with Ms Beamish, um, time permitting, the, the issue of uh, the cooperative models in, in renewables. It's something we share an interest in and I'd be keen to work with her on that. But Mark Ruskell summed up, this is an opportunity for progressive parties in this chamber to unite today to make a strong message about the future of unconventional oil and gas and also send a message to the Conservatives that the views of people do matter. We have listened to the science, we've looked at the economic evidence, something they have almost completely ignored and cherry-picked figures. They have cherry-picked figures which are distorted yeah. from the evidence that KPMG produced and it is just not working. Uh, indeed, uh, Mark Ruskell summed up very well, it's just not worth it and he is absolutely right in that respect. Uh, as set out in, the opening, in, in my opening remarks and confirmed to Mark Ruskell, we will use the licensing powers in line with the Scottish Government's position. Um, Liam MacArthur made two excellent speeches. I, th I thank him for his positivity in his remarks. 
Um, he's right to identify there are significant challenges that have been thrown up by the evidence, and we uh, do indeed have a, uh, a position where we've taken, taken perhaps a scenic route, not 55 million years. I can't take credit for the first 54 million uh, plus years of the process uh, that Angus MacDonald referred to, uh, but certainly the last uh, year and a half. Um, and indeed, Angus MacDonald and other members who cited the strong uh, views of their local constituents, I hope will be satisfied with the outcome today if Parliament votes to endorse our position. And, uh, and presiding officer, I'm aware that time is running out, but I want to just summarise, Christina McKelvey put it, put it well in saying we are putting communities first, and I think that is important. We also listen to the science, but clearly we have listened to the views of communities. And Claire Baker, I think, was right to identify the higher cost of extraction in Scotland that is cited in the evidence and it shouldn't be assumed that the industry will be as cost efficient as elsewhere in, in the world. Colin Beatty uh, mentioned the point about uh, high energy prices. I, I just wanted to see if Morris Golden was here in the chamber. I don't know if he is, but um, I was watching Scotland tonight last night. I think he'll be uh, perhaps reflecting on his remarks that fracking would provide a solution to the finances of Scotland in the next financial year. Uh, no, it won't, Mr Golden. You'll have to come up with another plan. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on unconventional oil and gas. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8377 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau, setting out a revised business programme. I would ask any member who objects to say so now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8377. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 8377 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Right. We now come to decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser is agreed, then all other amendments would fall. The first question is that amendment 8341.3 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend motion 8341 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on unconventional oil and gas, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to our vote and members may cast those votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 8341.3 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes, 28, no, 90. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 8341.1 in the name of Claudia Beamish, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Paul Wheelhouse, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll have a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 8341.1 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 90, no, 28. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 8341.4 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend motion in the name of Paul Wheelhouse, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 8341.4 in the name of Mark Roskill is yes, 90, no, 27. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 8341.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Paul Wheelhouse, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division, and members may cast the votes. The result of the vote on Amendment 8341.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur is yes, 90, no, 28. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that Motion 8341 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse as amended on unconventional oil and gas be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 8341 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse as amended is yes 91, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that... <laughs> that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members business in the name of... Oh, point of order, Ruth McGuire. Ruth Maguire, please. Hang on. Just one second. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given that Alexander Burnett didn't declare an interest in North Bankery Company Limited before summing up for the Tory party, I wonder if it would be possible to get clarification on whether he was speaking on behalf of his constituents or shareholders. <laughs> As the member will know, it is up to all members individually to make a judgment on whether or not to make a declaration of interest. That concludes decision time. We we'll move now to members' business in the name of Lewis MacDonald on helicopter safety. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.